Greetings, saints, sinners, believers, unbelievers, whosoever will. Welcome to the Alpha Ministries um, class, live broadcast of the Alpha series. Tonight we are going to be studying out the Solomon Syndrome, and we're going to be looking in the book of Ecclesiastes, and we're going to review some of the things that we went over last week. Um, we, are, I am going to try um, StreamYard, the the uh, platform that we use, has expanded there, and I think I'm pretty sure I can use the PowerPoint and share the screen and go progressively in the PowerPoint instead of doing it with just um, the JPEGs. So we'll see how that works out. All right. Um, just a real quick announcement. I have a lot going on this weekend as far as memorials. Um, tomorrow night at South Fork High School, I will be throwing out the first pitch. It's Veterans Night, and they've asked me to throw out the first pitch um, for Veterans Night for South Fork Baseball in memory of my son, Liam Lloyd, Corporal Liam John Lloyd of the United States Marine Corps. And uh, I'm going to be very happy to do that because he uh, was kind of like a mascot to the class of 98, Liam was when he was little. I sponsored that class. And then on Saturday morning, they're doing the, um, the fins up surf contest at Stewart Beach, and there'll be a paddle out for my good friend Ray Savinsky. Um, so that's just for those people on the Treasure Coast. There'll be a paddle out at the surf contest. Um, Raymond took some stellar pictures of all the local surfers. Anyway, and Sunday at Freedom Ranch is Veterans Appreciation Day, and they're going to be remembering the vets, and they have a whole bunch of things going on there. Um, and that's at 10 a.m., and you can find all the information of what exactly is going on on the website. All right, so we're going to jump into the study tonight, and it's going to start with um, it's going to start with a, a we're going to start actually in um, Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. Uh, that's not what we want. Hold on, I don't know how all this works. Um, we're going to start with the book of Ephesians, and we're going to look at. Um, Ephesians chapter 4, 17, and um, as we get into it, you'll be able to see. Just give me a second here to try to figure this out. All right, here we go. All right, so Ephesians 4, 17, okay, if you look at it, this is a really, really right here what we have in front of us too is, um, can everybody see that? Can you all see that? What we have in front of us in Ephesians is really pretty much the root of all addiction, all dysfunction right here. Okay, so if you look at this verse, it says, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in any, any, every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Now, as we unpack that, there's some key words, especially in the Greek language, that highlight this. So first of all, the futility of their thinking, the, the futility means emptiness, okay, to be empty. To be, in other words, you're an airhead. I had a um, high school teacher that used to yell at us and say, it's time to pull over and change the air in your head when we were just not getting it or acting dopey. So he tells us that you must no longer live in the futility of your thinking, that we are separated from the life of God. That word life is Zoe meaning the, the spiritual life, the, the source of all life. But Zoe has to do with that spiritual connection, that life we have in God and in Christ. So separation from God is the root of it all. Losing all sensitivity, that word in the Greek means that you 
have, you're not really aware of your own pain. And you don't really understand the pain that you are inflicting on other people. That's what the that's what the word having lost all sensitivity means. And when we're running in addiction, when we're running in self-centeredness, we hurt other people. And we're hurting ourselves. Um, I have someone that kind of stabbing me in the back that I've been trying to help. And they're in grief. They they recently had a terrible loss, and they're just angry. And the anger came in my direction this time. And uh, I just understand and realize that that anger feels so much better than the pain that's awaiting if you really face your grief and really face a loss. The anger it feels much better. So having lost all sensitivity, you're just not aware of the pain that you're in, the pain that you cause us. Or you give yourself over to sensuality. You're numbing the pain. So as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. The words there, sensuality, impurity, the, the words there, there's a word, a catharsis. A catharsis is an emotional cleansing, an epiphany. Something is really good that we need to have an emotional cleansing, a catharsis, that type of moment. This is the exact opposite. This is you're just sliming yourself up with all this sensuality and impurity. Pornography is a very good example of this. That it's, it's, there's such a deep addiction to pornography in our day. Um, one that's so easily accessible, but it slimes people up. They feel dirty. When wives find out about their husbands doing it, the wives feel dirty. They just There's just this act catharsis, this sliming up of the whole of everybody and you're slimed up and you're, you're caught, you're overtaken as it says in Galatians and notice that it's never enough. It's never ever enough. That's one word that the addict just does not know. They do not know the word enough. It's never enough. So here we are. The natural mind or heart, apart from God, is darkened, it's futile, blind, ignorant, hardened, never satisfied, cut off from God, enemies with God, and we seek to get our personal needs met outside of Christ. So the death certificate that Adam had was that he's in a spiritual sin-cursed body, spiritually dead in a spiritually sin-cursed body. That's Adam's death certificate. Now, we've tried to survive the fall with the knowledge of good and evil, which we'll look at more next week when we talk about, when we get into Romans and death to the law, you'll see that we tried to survive the fall with the knowledge of good and evil. But the other way is with lawless and licentiousness. So this deep separation that we have from God is painful, and we try to numb that pain. Now, we're going to look at what's traditionally known as the Solomon Syndrome, right? And the Solomon Syndrome is found in the book of Ecclesiastes, and it's everything that Solomon did to try to get his needs met. Solomon starts off by saying, Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. It's the same word that we see in Ephesians, futility, emptiness. So he says, I'm empty, emptiness, emptiness. And he says that he then, because of this emptiness, sought to find the meaning in life. What is life all about? And the first thing he said is he said to himself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much, much wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly, but I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. So the Lord told Solomon, you can have anything you want. And he asked for wisdom. He figured, man, to be smart, to understand things would be great. And he did, but it left him empty. It left Solomon as empty as a gong. 
And then he says, oh, I know. I know what I need. I'm going to party. Life's about feeling good. And he said, come now. I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But I also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is mean madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing embracing folly, embracing, I, it trailed off there. So he was a functional alcoholic. And as you see, in being a functional alcoholic, he also had like a thousand wives. So you know that he definitely was partying in that sense. And there was probably a lot of sexual morality with Solomon too. We'll see that because he said that he had male and female slaves. So he was a party animal, and he said that that too brought nothing. And then he said, I know what I, I know what life's about. It's about working. It's about projects. It's about, and it's about leaving something behind. Okay. They interviewed, um, there was an interview that was done with people that were, you know, in their 80s, 90s, and they were talked about their regrets and things. And, and they said, you know, what would you do, do differently? And one of the things that came up often was that they would do something that outlived them, that they wish they had left something, whether a book or a project or something that outlived them. So Solomon, he, he, he had some of the most sophisticated um, watering systems for his gardens and his orchards. He had, he had cattle, he had horses, he had barns. Um, you know, he made those reservoirs, and we know that he built one of the seven wonders of the world, Solomon's Temple. So he took great projects, and he said, even then, he said, this too is meaningless. Vanity, vanity. And then he says, I know. It's all about money. It's about property. It's about, and I, I think there's some of the partying in here, too, with the male and female slaves. And he owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. So Solomon became very fleshly. He tried everything and he said this too was meaningless. And he pretty much ended it all with saying, remember, remember your creator in the days of your youth. So Solomon. went through a cycle. He walked around in circles where it says that, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. That word, when he says no longer live is perpetual. Think of perpetual, perpetual. It literally means to walk around in circles. <laughs> it literally means when he says, I tell you, you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. It's perpetual, perpetual, where we get our word perpetual from to literally walk around in circles. And that's what Solomon basically talked about. He was doing all of his life. He was walking around in circles. So let's take a look at it. A false assumption is a lie based about our worth as persons. Our worth depends on other people or it depends on our circumstances. It's somewhere in the future. It states we are not worthy now, but I will be worthy if. So we know that these are our personal needs that we have. These are personal needs that must be met on a daily basis. We reviewed these for the last three weeks. If you're not familiar with them, you can go back on our YouTube channel or Facebook channel and look at the last few weeks lessons because we spent a lot of time talking about our personal needs. These are our needs. This is what gives us worth. <clears throat> and Solomon described trying to get all of these needs met. And what he explained was that with this vague sense of emptiness that he had, this vanity, vanity, all is vanity, I'm empty, this creates a deficit motivation. 
Now we're, we're familiar with deficit motivation, right? When we don't have food and we, we're in the need of food, we call that deficit motivation hunger. When we're dehydrated, we call the deficit motivation thirst. It means there's a deficit, we're lacking something, and we're motivated to go get it. So this vague sense of emptiness creates this deficit motivation, which creates the false assumption. We're empty, we feel worthless and empty, and we say, oh, I know what I need. Now, usually for the first 18 years of our lives, we're, we have people telling us all the time what you need to be worthy, and we kind of follow the plan. And then we come up with all of our own false assumptions. So this deficit motivation creates us to seek false goals, whatever that might be. And those false goals, when we reach it, we get some temporary satisfaction. And that temporary satisfaction will wear off and the emptiness will return. I was listening to a podcast. There's a podcast out there that uh, former President Obama and Bruce Springsteen are doing together. And Bruce Springsteen was talking about, you know, him be when he really made it to stardom and really had big bucks in the bank and all this money and all this fame. He said it didn't take long for him to start hating himself, <laughs> for all the self-hatred to come back. So he got a lot of temporary sat satisfaction. He reached his false goal and it all came back, just like Solomon said, it came back. So the vague sense of emptiness returns after temporary satisfaction. That temporary satisfaction, okay, can last, I don't know, it can last a long time. It could maybe last years. Um, Research shows and the data shows that when people are infatuated with another, that honeymoon period of infatuation lasts no longer than 18 months. So you might say the temporary satisfaction could be, you know, let's say that it's a year. Let's say it's less. But when the vague sense of emptiness returns, we pursue some other kind of false goal. Oh, that didn't work. I know what I need. Maybe it's I need to make more money. Maybe it's I need to get a promotion. You get the promotion. You, I need to be with that woman or that man. I need, right? And remember, we have long-term and short-term. So that vague sense of emptiness comes back. And so we begin to pursue another false goal and that temporary satisfaction. So we reach the goal. We get temporary satisfaction. The emptiness comes back. Deficit motivation, false assumption, pursue false goals. So we perpetually go around in circles, right? I will be worthy if. Well, I'll be worthy if I can get that job. I get that job. I get temporary satisfaction. Now I hate my boss. I'll be worthy if I had a better boss, if I got a promotion, if I made more money. I make more money and I got shifted to another department. They, so we go around and around and around. We go until something blocks our latest false goal. An obstacle comes in the way. So what we do is we say, oh, I got to get I got to get through that obstacle. Boom, boom. We bang our heads against the wall, so to speak. I got to get around this obstacle. How am I going to get around this obstacle? We might go see a counselor and say, you know, counselor, um, you know, my husband or wife isn't acting the way I want them to. How am I going to manipulate them to love me or how or my kids aren't behaving, whatever it is. We go for counseling or we we ask everybody, we say, hey, everybody pray for me. And we're praying that we can get around the obstacle and get our false goal. But. Sometimes, because God loves us, that obstacle stays there. And we say, in the mighty name of Jesus, I command this mountain to move right now. And only when, you know, we pray, Jesus, help me reach my false goal. It's only when we say, man, I'm powerless. 
I mean, it'll drive us nuts. I'm powerless. My life is unmanageable. Then we are have the opportunity to believe the truth. To believe the truth and believing the truth means that we are going to start out and we're going to believe that we are worthy based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't need other people. Our circumstance don't have to change. Our worth is dependent on God alone in what he did through the death, burial, and resurrection of his son. Which means that we believe the Christ-centered assumption. We believe the truth every day, every minute. We have to believe this. We believe that I am worthy because God has made me worthy in Christ. We ask God to convince us of our worth. We ask God to show us. We ask God to reassure us. We ask God to push these truths of our worth deep down into our heart and soul to convince us. Now it's right there for us, but the Holy Spirit is our comforter and the Holy Spirit's going to bear witness. The problem is, is we've been fed so much garbage and misinformation about the Holy Spirit convicting us or God getting us or, you know, we are worthy. It has to be unconditional or it doesn't work. God's love and acceptance for us and his willingness to move us forward, his willingness to be with us in our pits of despair, to be with us in our boxes that we put him in, his willingness, his patience, his peace is going to convince us that I am worthy based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We believe this. And we say, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. And then our true goal is to minister. Notice at the top of the chart, once you understand your worth in Christ, then the life of Christ is in you and you have a desire to love other people. You actually have a desire to share, minister the love of Jesus Christ because it's such a great thing. Why keep it a secret? Why keep it to yourself? So the true goal then is to love other people and it's only when we know our worth. Those obstacles become trials and instead of trying to get around them, we go through them. We have eternal satisfaction. And instead of a vague sense of emptiness, we have this satisfaction in our souls that we're satisfied and we can rest in his presence. God promises us that he will put our hearts to rest in his presence. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen now, and we'll see. I'll ask the panel how that worked out. I, I couldn't see much of the screen. I had to focus on the PowerPoint. Um, so that is the Solomon Syndrome, and that's believing the truth of our worth as persons. Okay? Now the problem is, is that every single day we face that vague sense of emptiness. Okay, because we have, they're, they're, we're bombarded with lies on a daily basis. There's nothing that's going to tell us that we're worthy. There's nothing that's going to tell us that we're worthy except God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. There might be people that praise you, that pat you on the back, and that'll give you some temporary satisfaction. But quite often our circumstances, the criticism from others, our failures make us feel worthless. On a, on a daily basis. So I know that for me, you know, believing the false, believing that false assumption, believing that lie. And I used, I've always said that you can take any situation you're in and go right, cut right to the chase, say, I will be worthy if, and fill in the blank. And the only, the only, I, I can give testimony to this. Um, 
early on when I learned it, I would force myself to believe it, which gives you some relief when you change your thinking. It gives you some relief from the emotions, but I was not convinced. So it was up and down, believing the lie, getting angry, taking things into my own hand, turning to the flesh, reverting back to fleshly means because of lack of patience. But God teaches us and is patient with us, and he wants us to believe the truth. God is inviting us all the time to believe the truth of our worth in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is to convince us of that. The Holy Spirit is the comforter, will lead us into all truth, the truth of who we are in Jesus Christ. So the more you believe it, the more relief you get. And the more that you get that relief and you take a deep breath and know that you're worthy, you can look outward. And Jesus said, from within, streams of living water will flow. And I never understood it until Bill Gillum pointed out that those streams of living water were flowing outward. And most of the time, we're not, we're not aware of the impact that we're having on other people because it's the power of the spirit. And you've probably had people come to you and say, man, you know, like I had someone come to me once and said, you know, you saved my life. I'm just like, what? And I didn't do a thing. It was the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through us. And I, I know there's people that have impacted my life that they probably don't know how much they've realized because it's flowing outward. But the true test came for me when I said, you know, take any situation in life. I will be worthy if and fill in the blank. When I lost my son in May of 2019, I was in great despair. I was despairing beyond despair. <laughs> I was in hell. And I began, and I think I've mentioned that I, I, wanted, I wanted God to at least give me a vision of Liam. Let me see them. Just like you saw Elijah and Moses, Lord, let me see them. Let me see them. I want to see them. You can do it. Why, why can't you do that for me? And I would argue with the Lord. And he finally convinced me. Two things that he showed me was what would you rather have, a vision that's here and gone or my presence, my life in you 24-7, me walking with you. But the other thing that I I did is I said, I know that if I'm going to get through this, I have to believe the truth. And the lie that I was really believing was I will be worthy if my son was alive. I'll be worthy if my son did not take his life. I will be worthy if. And the truth of the matter was, is that because Jesus loved me, Jesus died for me, God gave his only son, and what more could he give? Because he's reconciled all things, because I've been crucified with Christ, buried with him in a brand new person, raised up, seated with Christ in heavenly places. I'm an heir of God and a co-heir with Christ. Because that is true, I am worthy. I am worthy. And believing that brought me back from the depths of despair. So I can honestly tell you that I believe it with all my heart that every frustrating, terrible situation you find yourself in, if you do the work with God and say, okay, God, I'm believing a lie, I will be worthy if, and then fill in the blank, and say, okay, that's a lie. Right now, I'm worthy based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm loved, accepted, and forgiven. I have meaning and purpose in life. Nothing in all creation can separate me from the love of God. In fact, his power is made perfect in my weakness. It's by grace that I've been saved. I've been raised up. God justified me before the foundation of the earth. I am worthy. I am okay. I take a deep breath. Lord, how do I love other people? What is 
what is my ministry today? What, what, what do you have in store for me today? All right, I'm going to bring on Dave, Tom, Jim tonight. So we have the boys club going on here. <laughs> the boys club. Um, let's see. Um, Tom, we haven't seen you in a while. Why don't we start off with you? How are you doing All tonight? Right. Have I got sound? Yeah. You, you do. Okay. Great. Yeah, it's uh, I'm, I'm uh, back in the saddle in more ways than one. Um, yeah. Had uh, pretty rough uh, back surgery and kind of kept me down both physically and emotionally for a couple of months there. But uh, I'm back. Good to be back. Um, so, yeah, uh, this uh, book of Ecclesiastes, I've been wanting to uh, do some extended teaching on it in my, my cowboy church broadcast that I do on Sunday mornings early. But I've been in the middle of Galatians, it's probably going to take me another six months to finish the, the last three chapters of the book of Galatians, <laughs> but I'd like to get to that. But um, Bill, you um, you mentioned often uh, Bruce Springsteen, and I know you, he's one of your musical heroes. I'm going to talk about one of my heroes and some of his experiences, because you kind of shook that loose in me when you were telling that brief story. Uh, but um, one of my heroes growing up and through my adult life has always been Ernest Hemingway. And uh, his first great novel that he wrote uh, was called The Sun Also Rises. And um, it was written in the, in the mid 1920s. So he would have been uh, about 20 in the mid 20, about 25 years old when he wrote this novel. And this novel uh, apparently liter 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 literary wise is so good that it's taught in a, a lot of freshman uh, American literature courses. Uh, I know my son had to had to read the book, and uh, it's really interesting because the book's about the plot of the book is about this group of rich American kids who were well educated, uh, many of them very talented artistically, uh, musically, uh, physically, you know, sports and things like that. That were living in Paris. Uh, trying to figure out the meaning of life and how they kind of went round and round in circles trying to figure out the meaning of life. And it, when you open the book and read the, the before the, the first chapter, uh, the quotation in there is from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 5. It says, the sun also rises, rises and the sun goes down and hastens to its, the place where it rose. Uh, so even a young Ernest Hemingway could recognize uh, that this group of his peers was literally running around trying to satisfy their needs uh, through a variety of things. And, you know, and the story had a lot to do with sexual experimentation and a lot of drinking, a lot of partying, uh, a lot of uh, disciplined uh, writing on, on Hemingway's part and on and on and on. And his life uh, really mirrored that. Um, I, I think he really figured out the problem. I really, I think he really figured out uh, probably what Mick Jagger was singing about when he said, "I can't get no satisfaction." You know that the <laughs> that, that the youth of the world, uh, just like in old Solomon's time three thousand years ago, uh, could not find satisfaction, um, could not find any any long lasting. Uh, succor from the, the constant quest uh, for you know feeling better, and um, you know old Hemingway man he I mean he did it all I mean uh, he, you know he was a, a, a accomplished big game hunter one of the preeminent writers of his time he won the Nobel Prize for literature uh, he was a, uh, a big game fisherman and, and, and a world traveler and a and, uh, and a great adventurer and wrote all those stories so wonderfully. Uh, but unfortunately, his uh, end was very much similar to what King Solomon described in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 17, where he says, therefore, I hated life. You mm -hmm. know, and so whether you're reading 
Solomon's version or whether you're reading Hemingway's version or whether you're listening to Mick Jagger's version, the problem is the same. The only, the only sorrow here is that they never discovered the solution. Uh, now, Solomon gives you the answer to the solution later on, but, um, you know, uh, I'll kind of shut up there. I could talk a little bit more about recognizing false, false goals and maybe we'll get to that, but that's the parallel I can make here. And, and that it's just a way that I can really relate to what, you know, King Solomon was really saying. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. You know, yeah, there's, there's tons and tons of examples because it's the human condition, you know, and, and people write about it all the time. They sing about it, you know, whether it's, I can't get no satisfaction or, you know, it's a, I mean, you see it all the time, like death of a salesman by Arthur Miller is one of my favorite, Willie Loman, you know, I'd be worthy if my son was successful, if I was successful. I mean, it's on and on it goes. Um, Cause it's the human condition. You know, art imitates life. David. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, sir. This is, uh, again, grateful to be a part of what we're doing here. You know, if you step back and look at this, this is, you know, this is a teaching, but it's, it's, it's such a reality for every human being that this, this goes on in each of us. And the, the realization that, that, that it does, that it exists in all of us, the fact that we're always searching for worth in, you know, what Solomon experienced trying ever going to the ultimate, which a lot of us aren't capable of doing because we don't have whatever it takes to do that, but chasing everything to the extreme. And then at the end of it, realizing that it's, I'm still empty. I'm still void, but we all do it at a certain level. I mean, the American dream, you know, whoever dies with the most toys wins all of these beliefs or thinking processes that you get a better job, get more money, get a nicer house, get nicer vehicles, get more vehicles, get more, get a boat, get this, get that toy, you know, have a garage full of toys. It's always, we're, we're trying to meet needs, you know, the physical needs of, of these this goal that we that we're, we're entrenched in our hearts and our minds is that you know these are the things that are going to make us happy, make us fulfilled. But the reality is, is that if we're really honest with ourselves, they don't. As Solomon, the example of Solomon, the example of what what was just talked about, um, Tom, and the real in that reality hitting home that it's, it's, a, it's a function that we all go through, this Solomon syndrome of searching for to fulfill this empty void in our hearts, this emptiness, this vexation, this total emptiness that we keep coming up on. And from somebody coming from an alcohol and drug and coming from in the flesh and been to, from a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety, you know, waking up every morning, you know, in fear, just fear of life, you know, totally consumed with that kind of stuff. These two, you know, kind of broke off into back into feelings a little bit there in reference to, you know, God meets our physical, personal, or first our, our physical needs and our personal needs. But so this, the truth of this being revealed in my own life, the, the teaching in and of itself is just is, is to reveal to us that we go through this process. And um, and like Bill put, when we get, if we can realize that we're powerless and our lives are unmanageable, when we're going, through, when we start into one of these processes and have the, a personal realization that he gives us, God gives us, that that's what we're doing. We're trying to, we're trying to fill a void. And if we can, start he listening and hearing what he's trying to teach us that we don't need to go that route so th th it's a it's a process that, that that's occurred in my life to not have to chase after so many false goals as i did before and then <clears throat> running into obstacles that's a you know a, a, from my perspective a lot of those obstacles are god puts an obstacle right in my way trying to tell me to 
you know, stop heading that way. That's not what I had had in mind for you. Even if I step out in faith, I'll go run into a closed door or an obstacle. Learning to accept that, learning to back away, realize that I'm not running the show. I'm, I'm just being, I'm, I want to allow him to lead and run my life. It taught in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, there's a chapter just devoted to, you know, we, we try to run the whole, the whole, the, the play. We're, we're part of a play and life being the play. And we're trying to organize all the players to do everything we wanted to do the way we wanted to do it. And then the goal that we believe that we're going to have from that is that we'll be fulfilled. If, if everybody would just listen to me, everything would come off a lot smoother. That's that powerless. We're powerless over over that thought process in, in our own minds. So I'm just going to kind of leave it there. I thank you for letting me be a part. Thanks, Dave. And, and you know, when you when you when you uh, paused and you said that, oh, I'm talking about feelings again, this stuff all I mean, it all overlaps you can't yes. get away from feelings. You can't get away from needs. It's all it's all tied in. Um, together and, and it, it's in fact it's probably good to go back and talk about you know the, the block goals and anger and all that before we get to Jim I wanted to uh, in um, let's see for Tom let's see if we, hold on there In the saddle again. <laughs> Thank you. Back in the saddle again. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Tom's back in the saddle again. The saddle. Thank you, Gene. All right. Jim, <laughs> you're up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bill, that was awesome, man. I can't wait to hear this again on YouTube. I watch it. That was that was good. That whole thing you did. Um, I got uh, on our. I think I said last week how we live on the knife edge. Yeah. Between between the deficit motivation and the expressive motivation. Yeah. We're going to go one way or the other, and sometimes we do that a hundred times a day. But um, the Lord kind of showed me a few more things on that. Um, and the main thing was control. So I wrote down sick and tired of being sick and tired, you know, like, like we'll stay in the bottom half of the chart because we're in control, which means we're not believing the truth. We're motivated by fear, guilt, and pride. And we're trying our best to get our needs met at whatever means possible. Um, through whatever frustrations, um, like for myself, I, I used to live in all the sinful emotions. That's all I ever knew. I didn't know anything else. Until one day, you know, and, and then even temporary satisfaction is better than no satisfaction. So at least you're getting that out of life, you know, even though it doesn't last long, it's something. Until one day, it's, there's, you know, I just said, there's got to be more to life than this. And I was just, um, you know, you, you, you could say it was a bottom. It was just another bottom. Um, you know, there was, I was sober. Um, I, I was in recovery and and recovering from the addictions, but there was still something missing. It's like, this is all there is. And it, 
wasn't until I gave up the control. Um, Jesus said it, if you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life, you'll find it. Well, that's kind of like giving up control. And actually, uh, there was a story, I, I don't know if I could say it right, but it was about a bunch of wild horses that were used to running free and doing whatever, coming and going as they please and doing whatever. And then a few of them got caught and, and they, they corralled them and, you know, they had to work now for the owners and all that. So the ones that were still got loose used to go to the fence and they would see them in the stalls in there and they would talk back and forth. And they were talking like, man, I can't believe you got caught. I'm really sorry you got caught. You don't have your freedom anymore. And so then they would say, well, we've, we've got a roof over our head. They feed us. They brush us. They wash us. It's pretty much we got it made here. All we got to do is whatever they ask. So then the wild horses, they were, they were like, well, I can't, I can't give up my freedom for that. They didn't want to give up their, their right to be in control of their own life. Follow me. Yeah. And that was kind of like me. I was a wild stallion that refused to be broken. And, um, you know, Jesus said, whoever falls upon this rock will be broken. But whoever the rock falls upon will smash them to pieces. Well, he broke me. I finally met someone bigger and badder. <laughs> and he kicked my ass. <laughs> so, um, so then I started um, asking him because the chart is where we live. And he uses it with me to show me where I'm at in my thinking. Um, and it could be a hundred times a day. Like, like usually I, if I don't catch it in my thinking, I'll catch it in my emotions because something just, I won't feel right. I don't have any peace. Something ain't right. And it'll go back to me not believing that I'm okay. So he uses the chart to constantly bring me back. So So I'll go from unbelief to believing. So I'll go from fear, guilt, and pride to faith, hope, and love as the motives of the spirit. So with him being in control, the more that I, um, like at first, when I first started to let him drive and I'm going to be the passenger, it wasn't, I had to kind of make myself do it. Um, it was, it was scary. It was something because I don't, I don't know if, if I'm going to surrender my will and my life over to him, how do I know he's going to give me something I'm going to want to do? I mean, how do I know I'm going to be happy? How do I know, you know, you don't, but I did it anyway. So the more that I did it, and the more that he shows up in my life, the easier it is to do it again. So, and then, so then my goals will be true goals of ministry. Like I, I will, you said, will automatically want to love others. Well, you know, before I got saved, I never had a problem. It wasn't until I got saved. Because I didn't care. I, I used to, I didn't care about anything ever. I just, me, myself, and I, I didn't care. Yeah. Now I care about everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so my true goals of ministry is to love others, whatever, however the Lord leads. And when I actually do that, it's like he lets me experience his joy. Like if, if you, you believe you're hearing God 
tell you to love somebody. So you go love that person. And when you walk off, like they, they could they could thank you for saying that it was just what they needed at the time or something like that. You walk off with an enhanced sense of worth that there's not a drug on this planet compares to. And I can tell you, because I've done them all. That enhanced sense of worth that, that confirms that, yes, you're hearing him. Yes, that was God. Yes, you're a child of God. Yes, you are, you're secure in his love and significant in his plan. It just, it, it builds you up. And then it's eternal satisfaction. It doesn't ever fade away. That's another, that's a memory that you'll remember. And the euphoria in that is just as real now as it was then, however many years ago it happened. So it's, the satisfaction is eternal. It doesn't ever wear off. So um, and it also in the upper half of the chart, what I'm starting to experience now in my life is I, I wrote down the scripture. It's uh first John 418 that there's no fear in love but perfect love casts out fear. Fear involves torment. Yeah. So down here in the bottom half of the chart, we're scared shitless trying to save our own life. In the upper half of the chart, we've got peace and contentment. We've got a joyful, confident, confident expectation about our future. We're secure in his love, significant in his plan. There's no fear in that. So in the word perfect love uh, I think the definition of that perfect is mature. So the more that you, the more time you spend in the upper half of the chart and the more time that we're hearing God and actually by faith acting on it, we're maturing and we're, we're, we're getting, uh, we're growing up, we're maturing. So we're becoming less fearful. Follow me. Yep. I, I'm, I'm, that's happening to me in my life now. Um, and it started with, it all started with being sick and tired of being sick and tired and willing to give up control and let God, I, I, I pray, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief because I got a ton of it. So, yeah, that's it. I think that, I think that's such a good place to be. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I, I, I just, I've prayed that my, my entire life pretty much, you know, and um, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief because we're bombarded on a daily basis. Um, and I think, you, you know, you talked about fear, guilt, and pride, Jim, and faith, hope, and love. And um, I think we'll spend some time with that next week too because it's real important to know that motivation, you know, um, you know, you think about like I was reading about Saul on the road to Damascus going to put Christians in jail. And when God, you know, blinded by the light, when he, Jesus spoke to him in the book of Acts, gives a little bit more later on. He gave a little bit more of what was said. But what did Jesus say to him? He said, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then he says, it's so hard to kick against the goats, you know, and he, he talked with him with love and compassion. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, you better knock this off or I'm going to get you, you mm -hmm. know, and um, that's not God's voice. So we'll probably spend some time on the motivation of the flesh versus the motivation of the spirit. Um, because the, the, that was a good way to end it with the perfect love casting out all fear. And I never thought, Jim, you kind of said that it's a progressive thing. You know, mm -hmm. and I always I always think that, man, everything's supposed to come all at once, splashing down on me from heaven. And I'm like, why do I still fear at times? Perfect love cast out all fear. But it all is a process. We are growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, and that's a process. You know, as we get to know God better, we really get to know each other, ourselves better. And um, that's a good thing. Any last thoughts, guys? We're going to look at 
Yeah, I, I, need get, I need to get uh, Jim to come join me on my Cowboy Church broadcast because he shook loose a bunch of stuff in there that uh, <laughs> with his horse analogy, which yeah. I don't really relate to a lot. Um, but the one thing I want, thought I wanted to come, kind of leave you with is, you know, well, so how do you recognize the difference between a false goal and a true goal? Um, and I'm not going to give you the answer, but I'm going to give you a clue. Uh, and that is, is that you're not going to be able to identify a false goal versus a true goal by using your own understanding of the knowledge of good and evil. That will only get you lost and more confused and more frustrated. Yeah. Uh, and and more and give you more vexation of spirit. And I'm just going to leave it right there. Good, 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 good. Thanks, Manuel, for joining us. Dar, faithful Tammy, thanks. And I guess if you need to get rid of bugs, go to Bugs Are Me. <laughs> um, one of the other things um, this this um, Sunday at Freedom Ranch is the the Veterans Appreciation. And then the following Friday is Good Friday. They're going to have a Good Friday service. They're going to have part of a passion play. Um, just go on the website. You'll see all that. And then on Sunday morning, they're going to have the second part of that passion play. So there will be a Good Friday service out at Freedom Ranch. So we have a lot going on. Spring is coming. Easter is coming. We'll be here next Thursday, um, same time. And we'll, we're going to, this is the real exciting, this is like very exciting part of the study for me as we begin to get into Romans 6, 7, and 8 and see the good news that God has, um, even in the midst of our struggles, even in the midst of our suffering, even in the midst of our conflict, um, we'll, we're going to get into that. So next week we'll talk about fear, guilt, pride a little bit versus faith, hope, and love. And we'll, we'll start, we'll start getting into Romans 6. And the the whole goal of going through Romans 6 is really to, to give us all the data we need to be at the top of the chart. All the data we need to say, yeah, I am worthy because God has made me worthy in Christ. In other words, we're going to get a lot of information to nurture that truth. Of our of our worth in Jesus Christ. So, um, how do I get off that screen now? That's weird. Um, we're, so we're gonna we're gonna go over that next week, and we're gonna begin. So if you want for homework or do some pre readings, begin reading on your own and asking God to reveal truth to you in Romans six, seven, and eight. Again, guys, thanks for all of your input and your fellowship. It's been great once again. Have more energy than when I started. So uh, we'll see you next week. And thank you, everybody, for joining.